The year is 1972, and you're looking for a distinctive wagon in which you can haul your rather large family. There, of course, are choices from General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, and even American Motors. But upon further examination of the offerings from the, we'll call it Big Four, you find that Chevrolet offers some very interesting features that the others simply don't. Most notably, the Chevrolet has a tailgate that disappears as well as a top portion of glass in the rear, enabling you to load the wagon without having to swing a door out or drop a tailgate. Given that you're somebody who likes to tow quite a bit and hate it when you have to unhitch in order just to get things out of the back, this has an interesting value proposition to you. So you want to take a closer look at the 1972 Chevrolet Kingswood Estate Clamshell Wagon. The clamshell wagons were introduced by General Motors in 1971, and every division of General Motors, except for Cadillac, had a factory-offered style version of this wagon. The idea behind the so-called clamshell was that it was a bit annoying for owners to have to open a door or drop a tailgate in order to get cargo out of the back, particularly if they were trailering vehicles. Because as an example, and as I previously mentioned, you often had to unhitch in order to be able to open the door or drop the tailgate. So that was impractical if you had a Chrysler or Ford wagon and GM thought it had its own solution. There were a couple different versions of the clamshell tailgate. On the lower end, there was one that didn't really have power assist for the tailgate, but to open it, then you would rotate the key to the right and the window would slide up into the roof. You'd then rotate the key to the right again and the tailgate would drop down and you'd have to kind of give it a gentle push into the floor where it would be stowed. Then if you wanted to get it up, you would just pull it back up manually with one hand. And even though the gate was pretty heavy, you could do that because it was counterbalanced. Then of course, you would just turn the key to the left and then the window would slide back down. Let's take a look here at the operation of this manual tailgate. The first thing to know is that you have to raise the window by more than eight inches in order for the tailgate to release. So you can see here it's not up more than 8 inches, and then if you rotate those tabs, the tailgate isn't dropping. It's automatically locked out. But now let's raise the window glass a little bit more past 8 inches, and you rotate those tabs again, and watch what happens. Here it goes. Boom! The tailgate drops. Now you do have to push it down manually into the area beneath the floor, And then you can continue operating the glass and raising it if you so desire. There's also a safety feature on these, and that's that you can't lower the glass beyond that 8 inches of opening with the tailgate drop. So watch, the glass just stops right there. And that's so that you don't bump your hand as you try to pull the tailgate up. You do that by grabbing a hold of that pull handle and raising it up here, and you have plenty of clearance given the window won't drop all the way until that tailgate is raised. So let's pull this up. And you can see what happens as we raise the tailgate. Just pull up on this. It's counterbalanced, so it's relatively easy. Now it's latched close. And then you can lower the window the rest of the way to close the tailgate by rotating the key. For the more luxurious versions of the clamshell tailgate seen here on this Buick, you notice the glass is raising up into the roof. Then the tailgate will drop by power. Here you go. It's power operated. Notice there are no tabs on that key on the passenger side rear quarter panel because this is a power operating tailgate as well as the glass. And now the glass comes down and here you'll see the tailgate raise on its own to close the clamshell. Chevrolet and all the other General Motors divisions except for Cadillac introduced its version of the clamshell in 1971. As you can see here in this ad, the clamshell is the Kingswood Estate at the top left. And it was part of their overall wagon portfolio. There was also the Concourse Estate, or really the Chevelle-based wagon, and the Vega Comeback. For 1972, the Kingswood Estate got this new authoritative-looking front end, although it was also handsome in 1971. But I think the 72 is the best-looking, and it had the vinyl wood grain side here, which a lot of the luxury wagons had, really a throwback to the woody wagons of yesteryear. Mercury, of course, had its yacht deck paneling wood grain on its wagons, and Chevrolet had to have something similar. It just was what was in vogue on luxury wagons of the time. Notice that these wagons are not hardtop wagons. General Motors had let that slip by the wayside in the late 1950s and ceded the hardtop wagon market to Chrysler for a few more years before all wagons would 
have this type of body style. And now that we've reviewed the various types of wagons out there, can you tell if this is a power operated tailgate or a manual tailgate? I'll give you a second to guess. This is the manual tailgate on this Kingswood. You can tell that because you see the handle there that's built into the trim at the top of the tailgate and also the tabs that surround the keyhole on the passenger side rear quarter panel. So this is not a power operated tailgate on this vehicle, although as you saw, the window is still power operated. And here's a closer look at that keyhole. Notice those two tabs. Whenever you see those two tabs surrounding the keyhole, you know it's a manually operated tailgate. So just bear that in mind. If there are no tabs, it's a power operated tailgate. And as I said, in all versions, the glass is power operated. Turning now to the interior, we'll find that this vehicle has a few options. You notice the power bench seat in this particular Kingswood. And you also notice that black steering wheel and column all the full-size Chevrolets for 1972 had a black steering wheel and black steering column, irrespective of what color interior they had, as well as black elements of the instrument panel. The instrument panel top pad, however, is color-coded with the interior, but Chevrolet did save a bit of money making some of these interior bits black, irrespective of the color trim that you got on the inside. If you take a look from the passenger seat, You'll notice that color-coded instrument panel outside of the driver's binnacle. But take a look at the seatbelt buckle here. This was an interesting setup that GM used for a limited period of time, I believe for the 1972 and maybe early 1973 model years, and that was it. Notice the seatbelt buckle has a latch point at the end of it, and then there's also another latch point for something like a slot. That's so that you can clip the shoulder belt in that is stowed overhead, and then you don't have to buckle a separate shoulder belt. Remember during this time period, the shoulder belts often had a separate buckle from the lap belt, but not on these. And it was a good idea in practice, but there was no shoulder belt retractor. And as a consequence, this setup was kind of clunky. And like I said, it was only in use for a limited period of time before they would get the retractor in the roof. So you had two retractors for the front seat belts. Taking a look at the rear bench seat, we see that it's got pretty good room, and overall these clamshell wagons were indeed rather roomy. I would say there was more rear seat space than the Ford and Mercury wagons. The Mercury wagons were always riding atop 121-inch Ford wheelbase, as opposed to this Kingswood, which actually was on the longer wheelbase. More specifically, Kingswoods like this were on the 125-inch wheelbase, and the full-size Chevrolets were on 122-inch wheelbase. So you got bit more vehicle for your money when you got a Kingswood or a full-size Chevrolet wagon versus a full-size Chevrolet. Under hood in the Chevrolet full-size wagons was a standard 165 horsepower 350 cubic inch two-barrel V8 making 165 horsepower. Standard on the Kingswood estate was a 170 horsepower 400 cubic inch small block V8 breathing through a two-barrel carburetor. There were two big blocks available, a 210 horsepower turbojet 400 V8 and then there was a 230 horsepower 454 V8. Don't ask me why Chevrolet labeled a big block and a small block, both the 400, but they did, and that was an overall confusion during this time frame. And at least if you got a Kingswood, you had plenty of power to tow and also had a lot of space in the back. As I said, this is a six-passenger wagon, and you can see how spacious it is behind the rear seat. Plenty of room. The spare tire is actually in the passenger side, back by the window. Let's take a look at that location here. And now you can see the spare tire lurking underneath this cover on the passenger side. That was something that Ford also did. It was pretty typical of wagons to put the spare tire there. And it was out of sight, out of mind, and unintrusive in that location. So how did the full-size Chevrolet wagon fare in the marketplace? Well, overall, pretty well. They sold about 150,000 wagons in the 1972 model year in all the various trims, the Brookwood, Townsman, Kingswood, Kingswood Estate, etc. The base price of the upper end Kingswood Estate was about $4,300. That's about 38,000 or so base price in today's dollars. And remember, base price didn't include the goodies like power windows, air conditioning, etc. Buyers had to pay extra for those. So it was a relatively expensive wagon, but it did fare well in the marketplace, and people had mixed feelings about the clamshell. Some really liked its convenience for the reasons that I mentioned before. You could open the tailgate and get things out of the back without unhitching your trailer. And it was nice in that it disappeared entirely and made for a completely flat load floor. But the problems associated with it were, in some cases, if you tried to open it and 
you were in a freezing rainstorm or just gone through a car wash in the middle of winter. And yes, people in the north do wash their cars when the temperature is below freezing because the water in the car wash is heated. I know some people have commented on that, but you don't want the salt all over your car looking terrible. Well, if you did that and it was super cold, sometimes the water would then freeze on the tracks as you pulled out of the car wash and then you went to go put the tailgate down and it would drop on the ground. And some people didn't like that you had to wait a while for the glass to raise and then the tailgate to lower if you wanted to load your groceries. It just took too much time as opposed to opening a door. You can imagine if it was raining, that wasn't something that you enjoyed. And because that glass was so curved at the top, your groceries or whatever you put in the back would get wet if it were raining. Notice that one of the benefits of that curved glass was that there's no air deflector on the rear of these clamshell wagons, but it did mean that you potentially got soggy, well, cargo in some cases. Let me know what you think of the clamshell. I think they're pretty sweet wagons. I'd love to own one. I never have owned one though, uh, but maybe someday I will be lucky enough to do so. For now, I make do with a Ford wagon that I have, my Mercury Colony Park. And until I find the right clamshell, I guess that'll have to do. Thanks again for watching.